So good morning, everyone. Yeah. So firstly, a very warm, you know, thank you, and uh, I'm impressed that uh, so many of us are here so early to not only sort of up this early, but here, but in cleared security and everything else, so, so, so great to see. Uh, and, you know, what we're very sort of, I think, you know, fortunate to have a, a great panel this morning to, to talk about a, a subject that is, uh, you know, I think very sort of central as we think about emissions and sort of carbon markets of kind of the narrative, uh, you know, going forward. Um, so, by way of introduction, I, I'm Dale Hardcastle, a partner with Bain & Company. I lead our efforts around carbon markets globally. Um, you know, a topic that's that's close to many of our hearts, um, and you know, we really have, a, I think, a phenomenal sort of you know panel this morning, and you know, very sort of warm sort of thank you to, to everybody who's sort of come, as, as well as them for for making the time. Uh, what I wanted to do this morning was just do a little bit of sort of introduction to set some sort of context uh, of really you know what's happened over the last sort of 12 months, and you know how we sort of think about the discussion today, and, and then I'll introduce the the panel and sort of you know jump in. Can you slip to the next slide? Maybe I'll just ask you to do it. <coughs> yeah. Um, great. So I think you, you can go forward. I'll introduce everyone in a moment. Um, so as I said, I wanted to, to say a bit of an introduction. To, you know, if we kind of reflect on where we are sort of are today versus where we were in Sham El Sheikh, you know, 12 months ago, uh, in many ways, it, a lot of you know drama and has sort of changed over the last sort of you know 12 months. Yet in, in many ways, the kind of the imperative and why we're here and where we want to go has, has not. Um, and what we want to do like this today was was talk a bit about that contrast you know between the two and, and, and the like. Um, if we think you know first next slide about you know the imperative, I think we all sort of appreciate you know just how important you know carbon markets and voluntary carbon markets are when we sort of think about climate action. The ability to, to put a price on carbon, to sort of connect capital from where we, we need to sort of take action to people who need mitigation solutions and do other things is a you know critical sort of part of our ability to to address sort of climate change and the like. Um, and those market-based sort of measures are really sort of essential to be able to sort of do that to drive you know many of the different sort of outcomes that we all sort of seek to sort of endeavor, be it um, in, the, the sort of huge sort of efforts that are needed around, uh, you know, carbon sort of mitigation and sort of removal, uh, addressing issues to sort of protect nature and put a, a value on it today before it is sort of too late and it's gone. Uh, and, you know, being able to, to have a mechanism to, through the market, to be able to channel significant amounts of, of capital, of course, is, is, is sort of extremely important. Um, while reflecting, of course, the capital that we need is, is very much sort of up here the capital that we're sort of talking about moving today is, is way, way down here, and you know somehow we need to sort of close the gap. Um, but despite that sort of imperative and where we stand, next slide, um, it has been really a sort of a roller coaster year, to, you know, since we were, were sort of in Egypt. Um, and, and while I, I think it's sort of safe to say, if we sort of reflect back there, some of the, I think the early signs of some of the things that were kind of being sort of talked about were sort of present there. But if we look at you know what's happening across just I think a number of metrics such as, you know, how many sort of carbon credits have been sort of retired over the course of the year, um, the kinds of sort of articles in, that are being sort of written about the industry sort of outside this room and in the external narrative, uh, and other sort of, you know, concerns that are sort of being raised around what, you know, key participants and sort of companies who maybe were much more sort of active 12 months ago than they sort of are today has sort of shifted in, in a very sort of different sort of direction. Um, so if I reflect upon, you know, I think our efforts with, you know, some of the people in the room and sort of very sort of fortunate to have support from many of the companies that are on the panel as well, uh, I think we have sort of work, been working, you know, together with IT and many sort of others to look at, you know, what can we do to sort of, you know, shift this. Um, and maybe next and last slide. Um, if we sort of, you know, look at, I guess, you know, where we were sort of in, in I think in New York, we, with a group of sort of companies, have been looking at a number of different sort of actions around what do we potentially need to do as we look to sort of 2024 and, and sort of 25, you know, beyond to reposition, to pivot, to to set a, a, a sort of different sort of direction? Um, and we, I guess, have identified, I think, a number of sort of different, you know, areas that, that could sort of help to sort of, you know, shift that sort of direction from uh, reframing sort of communication and, and the potential sort of impact and importance of these markets, um, delivering sort of, you know, private sector sort of commitments and doing a number of other things. Um, and, and just, I think, f from my sort of own reflection, uh, it, it, over the last sort of few days, it, it does feel like there is sort of a subtle shift in the tide. Uh, 
uh, the, I, the tone uh, I would say sort of in New York and many many discussions there was 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 very negative about kind of the direction of what are we going to do, um, and even you know I personally sort of you know came into sort of you know COP28 with a sense of uh, it was going to be more of the same and the like. But uh, I think the the good news is it does sort of seem like at least in many sort of rooms like this and many sort of discussions over the last you know week or so that there is a sort of you know building sort of consensus a desire to sort of take back the market and sort of reframe the sort of narrative to figure out you know how do we sort of address the issues around supply and integrity and other things to use the the great you know work that has been done with with VCMI and ICVCM and other sort of infrastructure to start to sort of you know build a new and sort of move in a new direction um, and I guess with that, you know, that is very much what we'd like to kind of get into with our, our very sort of distinguished sort of panel today. Um, so let me sort of briefly sort of introduce them. Um, so first, we're very fortunate to have, you know, Jonathan Grant from, the, maybe next slide, uh, you know, from sort of Rio Tinto. He's the, the chief sort of, you know, climate sort of advisor there. Mm -hmm. As well as, um, you know, Kelly Hemrick, who's the, 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 the senior international climate policy advisor with, with the Nature Conservancy. Um, Dr. Steve Howard, who's the kind of uh, vice chairman for sustainability with sort of Tomasic and has uh, been a sort of leader in sort of driving efforts around carbon markets. And of course, you know, Sam Gill, kind of you know, president, sort of, you know, co-founder with sort of Sosavera. Uh, so I think a, a very sort of, you know, great group, a, a lot of sort of diversity of sort of, you know, perspectives that are there um, and look forward to kind of an engaging, you know, discussion this morning. So with that, uh, you know, perhaps I was going to sort of, you know, kick off by, you know, asking, you know, Sam to maybe offer a few sort of reflections uh, to perhaps, you know, you know, build on, to, you know, sort of my perspectives on to a little bit kind of the setup of, of what we've sort of seen this year. Uh, would love kind of to hear kind of your thoughts from kind of where sort of Severa sits around, you know, what we sort of see have been sort of happening and, you know, what has really been sort of changing around the narrative and, and some reflections that, that maybe go with that. For sure, I think what we've seen is a like a com confluence of of unfortunate compounding of factors. So we've moved into obviously as a a, uh, a bear market, a, a difficult macroeconomic cycle, and that's actually happened at the same time as this negative press campaign. And it's it's been a concerted press campaign by folks who actually have a principled opposition to the use of market-based functions to to drive down um, emissions. So. It, that, that's been really unfortunate because it, at the same time as companies have had to really dig down, look at, look at their, their, their budgets and, and really question every line item, the main value that, that the market actually has um, provided to companies until now has, has mostly been a marketing uh, boost. And so what we've seen is the, the, the one benefit to, to uh, companies was the reputational benefit they got from engaging in the market. That's been pulled away at the same time as the scrutiny has been placed on their budgets. And so what we're seeing is a lot of people pull back because it's a no-brainer. It's like, look, if I invest in this, I'm probably going to end up on the front page of The Guardian. And I'm also getting pressure from my CFO to justify every line item. And so that's been a really difficult thing for the market. And that's, again been again compounded by the fact that there's been some great actions taken by the market to try and self-regulate and improve some of the, the integrity issues, so for example the VCMI and the ICVCM, but they're at very critical stages where we're getting some deliverables but they've not quite flown into the market in terms of actually giving the sort of comfort that the market needs. So the market's very much in this sort of difficult stage where a lot of the work that's been done is in train but it's yet to bite. And then we've got this difficult macroeconomic cycle uh, compounded by um, the, the reputational kind of issues from the, from the press campaign. So it's, it's been a tough year, but I think what we're starting to see is, you know, some of some. I, I feel like we've hit the bottom. And we're, we're moving up again. Uh, so I'm, I'm quietly positive, and I can I can expand on that later. But yeah, of course. No, and I, I definitely sort of you know share the optimism, and it's, uh, I think it's important to reflect that, you know, even though. You know, much of the external sort of news narrative is focused on the negative. Uh, there are a lot of positive things happening, you know, below the surface and the like. Uh, maybe, you know, turning next to, to Steve, to, you know, Tomasic, of course, has been kind of an instrumental sort of investor in the space and has established, you know, Gen Zero as kind of a dedicated sort of platform to, to look at such investments among sort of other things. Uh, how, what's your thought on the investment climate sort of today and, and sort of what's been happening? 
Um, so, you know, both maybe just from a Tomasa perspective, but also, I mean, other things you sort of hear and sort of see more broadly from people you speak to. Uh, thanks, Dale. I think I'm slightly more um, optimistic than I was a year ago, even though it's been a tough year, like Sam said. I agree with everything Sam said. Uh, it has been a difficult year, and I do think um, the, we, we do need to... It's not a narrative, it's, it's, a, it's a really robust discussion of why, why market-based mechanisms for carbon are a good idea. Um, uh, and we need, to, we need to have that debate more vigorously. But maybe we needed to sort stuff out, the whole ICBCM stuff, uh, you know, tightening of standards, tightening of MRV, clarification around that it was really clear that companies have to reduce and invest. It's not just a buy credits option. So I think that had, that probably had to pan out, and it, it was so it's been a an ugly year or two from some ex, from some extent. But you can see that the long term corporates that are really serious about this, and there's a lot of them actually, that they're staying with the market, and they're so I'm less worried than I was. You know, I was worried we might do all of this activity and build expectations, especially in, in developing countries, there was going to be a huge flow of finance and it was going to sort of evaporate. I don't actually think that. I think we're going to see the markets firmer than that. I still think we need to do something extra. And there is a... a, a and I, you know, I've talked with you, Dale, before about this, but I think this sort of... It's rebrand this. Stop talking about voluntary... It, there isn't actually... Is there a voluntary carbon market? It, it's, it's, there's a, there is a carbon market, and it's all connected now. As, as we're starting to see corresponding adjustments, the country deals, you know, Singapore's been prolific in bilateral agreements. Yeah. Uh, in particular, you know, so Switzerland and other countries in setting these bilateral agreements, but also looking them for the voluntary market as well, where they're starting to have that. So you, you're coupling, the market's couple, starting to couple together. And I think we'll see much more of that, and we'll firm that. If you look at the... Singapore, just take, I'll, I'll take Singapore from a, um, from a Tamasat perspective. The tax that we've got there g generates effectively, I think it's about a sort of 2 million ton uh, incentive for credits, and it's uh, 18 US dollars next year. You might correct me if I'm wrong, Dale, you'll, you'll know the numbers better than me. 33 US dollars the year after, I think, yeah. is the, that, that's the tax price. So that actually, if you can buy, you, cannot, you can go for 5% of your of your liability, of your carbon liability with, with credits, that's a real incentive and that creates a, that's a meaningful price signal there because it means if it's, if it's in uh, the next, next, next year, anything under 18, 33, you know, if you can do $32, it makes sense. You save, save your money and, and in a meaningful way. So I think we're going to see uh, more, of these, more of these interconnections and, you know, Last thought on this, carbon's all, almost like, well, people said a global carbon price. This sort of, it's like the, the mythical thing to solve. The mythical silver bullet is a global carbon price. And we, we haven't got that. But we've got multiple carbon currencies. And we've, we've got sort of into, the beginning to get the sort of, uh, the foreign exchange equivalents of that. So that will, that will be interesting to see. And, we, and, the, and the currencies in the same way that other currencies are stronger or weaker we'll see that as a, as a price signal out there. So I think that's all starting to play out and we're going to see that accelerate towards 2030. No, I absolutely agree. And I, I think some of those you know, catalytic actions are, are, are super sort of important to, to start to build sort of momentum in a different direction. Uh, I mean, Jonathan, you know, Rio Tinto, of course, has, has bucked the trend a little bit, I would say, this, this year, as, as many, many companies have kind of gone to green hushing or, or whatever we want to say as they've sort of pulled back and sort of stepped out of the limelight. Um, you, your company and your efforts of kind of centrally to that have, have been sort of thinking about really how do because the voluntary markets sort of fit into the wider sort of climate agenda um, the kind of ambitious targets that you set you know within the mining industry to, to, to try to sort of you know push forward would love to to hear a little bit about kind of what, what your journey has been this year and what has been the, obviously the reaction uh, you know f from sort of external stakeholders around that as well yeah, thank you, Dale. Um, so, so Rio Tinto is a, a mining and metals company, um, and our operational emissions are about 30 million tonnes a year. Um, most of that is from the production of the metal and minerals, um, the, the processing associated with that. We've got a, a sort of a science-aligned target, 15% reductions by 2025 and 50% by 2030. Um, and we've always seen that offsets will play a role in our 
decarbonisation strategy. But what's challenging for us is how they fit towards our target uh, and how, what role they play uh, in, uh, in helping us towards our target. We're making major investments in renewables uh, and in decarbonising our alumina refineries in the 2020s. Um, but these projects take time to implement. And, uh, and in July this year, in our half yearly update, we, we announced that we're not on track with our 2025 target. Um, and the, the dilemma for us is, well, what role would offsets play uh, in, in closing that gap to that target? And, and of sort, you know, with the controversy in the, in the market around this issue, um, you know, what we didn't want to say is, well, we've achieved the target with offsets. Um, and, and we're investing in our own uh, nature-based solutions projects. As a mining company, we manage a huge amount of land and we're using some of that to, you know, it, there's, there's land restoration efforts, of course, as, as part of business as usual, but we're also investing in um, nature-based solutions projects. So it's not something that we've really been able to resolve this year. Um, and, I, you know, we've got, we've got time to, to figure that out. But I think that we're continuing to invest in those voluntary offset projects at and near our mining operations. Um, but it still remains to be seen as to how offsets really fit in that picture of our trajectory towards our, our targets this decade. Well, I think that that's great. And, uh, you know, I think fantastic to see... I think both the the honesty and the openness around, uh, you know, where the company is trying to go, but also, you know, how carbon offsets could fit into still being able to deliver climate action and smooth out, you know, the volatility that is inevitably inherent in the kind of scale sort of carbon sort of mitigation that, that a, a company like you is sort of doing. Um, and ultimately, of course, uh, you know, this is what we need all heavy emitting kind of industries to, to be sort of thinking about and, and using this, this market as a tool to, to be able to sort of, you know, drive kind of action uh, and sort of smooth out uh, sort of activity in a way that doesn't just wait for the last 10% of our emissions, but uses this as a, as a sort of active lever sort of, you know, through that. So I think we've heard, I guess, some sort of great examples of obviously, you know, companies who are trying to sort of use these sort of tools today, um, kind of the progress that, that's being made in sort of, you know, different areas with sort of catalytic action with governments like Singapore, as well as other sort of infrastructure from SAM. Um, all of which, you know, sp speaks to a much more sort of positive story than perhaps what we read in the paper every day, um, and a clear need to to start to sort of reshape the narrative and perhaps the story around, you know, why these markets are important and, and how we, you know, continue to build while recognizing that things are not necessarily perfect, but there are some very sort of, you know, significant benefits. Um, you know, one of those benefits that, of course, is, is most sort of notable is, is, is nature and, and how nature-based solutions to you know, can really sort of have an impact that goes more than just being the tool that we're sort of talking about, but have a, a wider sort of variety of benefits. And, and maybe Kelly would, would love to hear from you a little bit about, you know, what do you think we should be saying as, as we sort of look to next year and, and how can we take better control of the story? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think one thing in the past year that has really been a conundrum to think about um, is that, so it, the Nature Conservancy, we're, we're science-based, right? We try and think through everything first from kind of a science and methodological standpoint. And if you think about the improvements that the market's seeing, those are good things. We should be continually improving and learning within this market. Um, the way they're being framed, of course, in the media is that, oh, they're, they're failures and we should stop it entirely. Um, so the underlying kind of cause, I think, for some of these articles is not a bad thing. We should be open and honest and transparent about what we're learning if things don't work out, um, that's okay. You know, honestly, I don't expect with ICBCM and VCMI we're going to have this new meta standard and all of a sudden everything with an ICBCM label is going to be absolutely perfect. We're absolutely going to see a few projects come through that are going to squeak through the guidelines and then there's going to be a new Guardian article. Um, so that's not going away. But I think what's key is this framing, right? It's really thinking about this is a good thing. We want to be learning and we want to be improving and we want to be pushing the science and kind of the methodologies to be better over time. So we're constantly trying to close all these loopholes that are still kind of available in the market. Um, and that at its core is actually a really a sign of strength and resilience within this market that we should be celebrating and not being saying, oh, well, that's obviously evidence that we just need to, you know, throw it all out. 
Um, so I think that's going to be the hardest part. The other part with nature that's really difficult specifically is, you know, carbon, you take one car ton of carbon anywhere, it's the same anywhere in the world. Nature is not. You can't take a tree from somewhere and put it somewhere else and say, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a new tree. Um, so there's this inherent tension when you're talking about nature, which is that it's really hard to kind of get these really big, impressive, splashy numbers. Really, what the success stories are going to be are very specific to individual communities, you know, individual ecosystems. Um, and so you do kind of have this, this storytelling telling tension where it's a little bit more the success stories are really just stories about very specific places and what's happening. Um, and it's hard to kind of aggregate all of that up because it, you're really talking about very different metrics than just, you know, tons of carbon. Um, and so I think, you know, that's more of a comms issue of how do we, how do we tell this story in a way that doesn't just sound like, you know, PR coming from a project. Um, because I think when you do come down to stories, it does, there is that, you know, depending on who's telling the story, it really can kind of depend on, oh, is this just, you know, the project developer trying to toot their own horn? Um, so that's really, I think, where we need to think about who can actually tell those stories in a way that is really authentic. Um, which brings me maybe to my third point, which is just that, you know, a lot of the reporting, honestly, a lot of the people probably in this room, most of us are going to be from very developed countries. Um, we really need to hear from more from the people actually on the ground, you know, working on the projects, being impacted by the projects, being participants in these projects. Um, and a lot of times I think, you know, that is a kind of critical piece that is sometimes missing from these stories as well. No, definitely would agree. To, I mean, Steve, you've, you've been a, a great storyteller on many different sort of stories, you know, over the course of you, your, your sort of time with Tomasic and obviously We Me Business and other things that are before. Uh, what are your thoughts about, I guess, the, the narrative we need to sort of start to tell next year and maybe particularly what's missing? You know, what are we not saying that we should be saying to, to try to kind of shift, you know, where the, the discourse and the discussion is? I, th I think we probably are saying it. It's actually just being more consistent around it. I think you made a very good point, Kelly, about, you know, it's, it is really looking from project level up real benefits, real people, uh, legit, really, um, I mean, storytelling can sound, storytelling, when you said, I, you're, you've been a, a good storyteller, Steve, I was like, that sounds a bit, sounds yeah. a bit dodgy, that, doesn't it? But it, if it's actually painting a powerful narrative, I mean, it's really clear there's no net zero without carbon markets. You know, it's like, it takes some kind of miracle. It all has to be through vo unpaid voluntary action on a grand scale uh, to, for people to do everything. So I think we have to tell that story there. Um, we do need, and, and there are so many uh, businesses that are really decarbonizing the scale of, and, and the progress with uh, new technology, the, the targets coming out here of tripling renewables, exciting things like that. So we can see there is momentum in that. There are still, there are still incumbent industries that are not moving anywhere near fast enough. And, and you know, so, but I think we need to have a dialogue with Let's say, I, d I, th I think we can win the conversation with some of the people that you mentioned, Sam, who are basically deeply skeptical, with some cause about um, the private sector, about market-based mechanisms. I think we can begin to, let's say, create doubt with them at least. That, and that sounds like a tobacco industry blade, doesn't it? <laughs> but, create, but, it but based on real facts and real information. I think... When, when we set up We Mean Business Coalition, I was on the run-up to Paris there, and we said we need, a, if you look at, let's say, I'm, I'm going to say, a, a bad industry, bad industry was well organized, had a simple message, and, was, and basically hammered that message out. The science is uncertain, it was for a time. They said, the science is uncertain. If you care about the economy and energy, you, you know, let's keep doing what we've been doing and burn up the fossil fuels. Um, the... Everybody else was fragmented and had complicated messages that were heavily nuanced. And I think we do need some simple messages. And I think we do need, we need some really good PR, but honest PR based on real people and real carbon and real projects. And I think we probably need to come together with that and, uh, and do it, and do it in a, with a concerted effort. And it's not because we're malign, evil capitalists that want a license to pollute. Is because we want to see a net zero world and we want massive flows of carbon to save uh, nature, 
save the climate and improve people's livelihood. So that's, that's that, that we need to do that with some passion. And, you know, I don't know if we can reframe it because voluntary carbon market, carbon mar it's not, it, this, is, this is a, a save the planet funding mechanism. You know, we need to, so we need we need to turn turn this round so that people realise why we're why we're all doing this. No, absolutely, and I you know I, I can see on the one hand we're sort of uncomfortable <coughs> with the idea of telling the story and, and, and the like, but but I think at the end of the day, you know, we need sort of strong facts, we need sort of the messages, uh, but human beings and change are driven by stories. You know, to, I mean, it, it may sound odd, but it, you know it. I've worked in sort of consulting for a very long time, and you know, I always have young consultants come in and ask me, like, what should I do? How should I be successful? The things, and uh, you know, I always sort of tell them, you know, at the end of the day, we're storytellers. Um, we do, you know, all of this analysis. We work with companies. We do sort of other things, but if you can't communicate the analysis and the ideas effectively to drive the change that we want to drive, then you failed, right? Uh, and ultimately, the projects that we do and other things aren't gonna go anywhere. And I think, you know, similar sort of analogs sort of, you know, apply as we think about the market and what we want to do. We need to find the right emotional buttons that are backed up by substance and fact and other things to, to build sort of consensus and where we wanna go. Yeah. So, so Jonathan, maybe some reflections from you on trying to tell the story and uh, kind of your sort of experience over the last sort of six months, uh, probably good and bad, and, and, and maybe some sort of thoughts for sort of other companies as we think about trying to tell their stories and, and get them to be much more sort of forward in the market next year. Yeah, I mean, Rio Tinto is a, is a mining company. So, uh, you know, our stakeholders have strong views as to what we should and shouldn't do. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, we're we're primarily focused on investing in mitigation of our operations, you know, reducing emissions at our operations. Um, and there's, there's a narrative around that and about the pace of change and the challenges around implementing those projects, um, which is fine, um, if, not, is, is, if not as fast as we would like. Um, the, the challenge around offsets is that I think that uh, for, for many companies, they're seen as a sort of as an escape clause, uh, that you're doing that just just because you're you know you're not taking action uh, to address your own emissions, and and that's definitely not the case um, at Rio Tinto, given where we're putting our, our investment. I mean, in terms of mitigation investment, it's sort of billions of dollars, 7.5 billion dollars. We we made uh, capital commitments around over uh, over an eight-year period, and obviously our nature-based solutions investments are, are tiny in comparison with that. Um, but I still think those projects have a really strong investment case from a biodiversity or a, uh, or a community's perspective. I mean, these are projects in Madagascar uh, where there's real challenges around uh, deforestation near our minerals um, operations there. Similarly, in Guinea, where we have a new iron ore mining uh, development, and South Africa as well, uh, another uh, titanium uh, production facility. So, so there are great cases for these investments in, in, uh, in offset projects. And what I, what I struggle with is uh, now that companies are starting to make a virtue of not using offsets. Um, we have very hard to abate emissions uh, in the metal sector. It's going to take two decades to really start to push those emissions down. We're still having to develop the technology. And so there's a role to help in the interim by making these investments um, in, uh, in nature-based offset projects. And I think, I think that if we're telling stories, um, those stories need to come from the south and they need to, come, uh, they need to be about the benefits um, that these projects can bring. No, I think absolutely. And, and just kind of reflecting on to, you know, many of the, I guess, the, the companies that we work with, you know, you know, time and again, I would say over the last sort of year, we've heard lots of sort of examples from different companies who are very keen to, to drive nature and other sort of community outcomes kind of around their plants, around their sort of suppliers and sort of other things, um, but are somewhat sort of hesitant to go forward with the plans that they had planned to do sort of at the beginning of this sort of year, given concern that they're going to be kind of criticized or other things and the like. And, and obviously, that's a great travesty if, if this is where we sort of stand, that, you know, real companies are prepared to sort of commit real money towards things that have, you know, broader sort of impacts well beyond sort of carbon and, and the like, um, but uh, out of sort of concern about sort of being criticized, uh, 
they sort of can't get the board approval and have sort of pulled back, right? We definitely need to flip that around. Um, I'm very keen to, to, to leave a little bit of time for some you know, questions from all the people who got up early here today. Uh, but maybe just any sort of further reflections from, from Sam or sort of Kelly on things that we should sort of think about in terms of the narrative next year, building on you know, some of the things you, you mentioned before um, as we try to make 2024 a very different year than the one we saw sort of in 2023. Maybe one reflection, and I don't know what the solution is, but um, I do feel like there are more working groups and more kind of ways that different businesses and different NGOs and communicators are really trying to come together to kind of really align on the storytelling. Um, at least in the NGO world, I think sometimes there can be such thing as too many <laughs> working groups. <laughs> and you're talking all day in circles and you don't actually do anything. So I, I do think that'll be the big push for 2024 is not just to try and be, you know, alignment is great and it's really important, but at some point we need to actually do and not just talk about it. So I think that'll be the big challenge for next year. Yeah. I think one of my reflections is, I think this, you know, if you think about the classic uh, communication technique, you have the, the pyramid, right? At the top you have your narrative, then you have your key messages and underneath you have your facts, your evidence that support that. And I think when you look at how this market has tended to think about communication, it's, it's jumped to the bottom of the pyramid. So we've gone straight in with a very technical response. We put together a technical working group. We release a five-page paper, and we think, ah, oh, we've rebutted that argument. And it's just not, as you say, that's not how humans work. So we, th we work with narratives. And the issue is a narrative has, has set in and been internalized in a lot of, the, a lot of society now that the carbon markets are, are faulty somehow. And the way that we, we of course need to rebut that technically, but you need to plant a counter narrative. And then again, people, when they say, oh, let's, let's plant a counter narrative, they go straight to the bottom of the pyramid. And they, they want to come out with all these sort of technical arguments. But really, uh, uh, and again, we also like to air our dirty laundry in terms of having those sort of technical discussions in public. So what the market needs to do is get, get together. It needs to come up with its narrative, the top of the pyramid. We need to then have our discussions behind closed doors around what that bottom of the pyramid is, because we understand it, but only we understand it. The rest of, the rest of society doesn't. It's very, very technical. And then we need to come up with a consolidated communication strategy. But the, the, it's really been done back to front, basically, I think. Um, it's a panic response. So th there needs to be some coordination and, and some concerted effort to, to undertake that, I think. Yeah. No, absolutely. And you know, at the end of the day, to, you know, we have building blocks that I think many others who are trying to tell stories would kill for yeah. as we think about communities and nature and all sorts of you know, extremely sort of positive things that you know, anyone would agree are, are good things to be doing. Uh, we just need to, to, I think, reframe it the right way. Yeah. Like carbon markets, you know, save your planet faster or something. <laughs> there, there we are. Yeah. Steve's now going to run a PR agency. Great. Um, so any questions from, I mean, I have some other questions, but would love to, to maybe open it up here. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. So I'm Lucy Armand, and I run the Nature for Climate Coalition. So we've been doing, we're a bunch of NGOs, including TNC, and we've been doing a lot of work on the communications around building trust in nature-based solutions, and particularly have spent the last year focusing on voluntary carbon markets. And we have made a lot of progress in terms of identifying spokespeople from the Global South, what the stories are, getting the spokespeople to come forward. Where we have really struggled is having corporates come forward and talk very honestly about the issues that, Jonathan, you have just been very open about. Do you have any insights into how we may be able to help some of the corporates come forward and tell the stories about why, you know, how they want to use offsets and how they want to invest in nature? Well, d uh, in, to give you a very simple answer, you're in the right room. This is Aita. You know, you're, you're surrounded by corporates that are all support the role of market mechanisms to tackle climate, and most of them are investing in in the voluntary market as well. So, so I, I think th this is the you know these are the companies that should be championing uh, this approach. But I, I mean, I would, would agree, you know, having sort of, I think, talked to other actors similar to yourself, like NCSA and, and others as well, uh, I know it, it has been like pulling teeth to, to get companies who are willing to talk publicly about uh, things they should be very proud of, right? Yeah. I mean, I, just one other thing. I, I think that um, there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of focus on the standards and with ICVCM, rightly, ICVCM and VCMI. Um, it's still... 
a noisy environment and I think the standards are very high, too high sometimes, and I think it's challenging for a company to say, yes, we will subscribe to that standard because, first of all, we don't know exactly where it has settled, but sometimes it's the, 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 the bar is too high. So for, it, for Rio Tinto, for example, um, our scope three emissions are nearly 600 million tonnes a year. You know, that's country scale. Um, we couldn't sign up to a VCMI standard because the market wouldn't sustain that. Um, most of our scope three emissions are from steel production and aluminium production in China and other parts of Asia. So, so it's still a sort of a noisy environment. It's difficult for us to know how to put our foot forward without making a misstep. Thank you. Good morning. I'm a reporter at Carbon Pulse, and I'm curious to hear from our panel what your outlook for nature-based offsets is in 2024. And I ask this in relation to we're seeing a lot of discussion around technological carbon removal, so direct air capture, for example. And given the integrity issues that nature-based offsets are facing, we're noticing buyer behavior start to shift towards these more permanent uh, quote unquote uh, uh, carbon removals. Now, given that they're also still hundreds of dollars per ton more expensive than nature based offsets, yeah, really looking to, to get a pulse check from the panel in terms of what role you see for, for nature based offsets relative to this emerging carbon, uh, technological carbon removal um, offset play in the voluntary carbon market. I mean, I can take a first crack at that, and I, I don't know if anyone else has got some thoughts. If you actually look at, there's been a lot of noise in terms of uh, forward market commitments. Uh, so there's been a lot of press around technological removals. But if you look at the actual numbers in terms of issuances, it's tiny. And so I, actually what we're talking about is a very, very nascent space, which really, I, on it, this is a slightly controversial view, but I think really technological removals are almost at the point where they're not quite ready for a market-based mechanism. Because, you know, if you're looking at... Um, uh, direct air capture, for example, we're going to be looking at you know handfuls of thousands of tons at very very high prices. It's basically we're we're looking at kind of test contracts. So I, I think the the hey the market's going to move to technological removers tomorrow type discussion is is actually I think like a little a little bit of an exaggeration. What we're seeing is some really exciting movement uh, in terms of forward commitments for a for a hopefully scalable. Uh, new market that will emerge, but it's not emerging tomorrow, for example. So I think uh, my sense is like there's been a bit of a kind of like uh, reactive push towards, oh, look, you know, we need to, it's a, it's a, safe, a flight to safety, um, but the market will, I think, pretty quickly move back to nature when, it, you know, when the market um, activity actually starts to pick up again, there's no actual, you know, there's no real kind of... Um, alternative to nature in terms of like what's scalably available on the market right now. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has got kind of views there. Um, yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I work at the Nature Conservancy. We're obviously pretty bullish on <laughs> nature-based offsets. Um, but, you know, but maybe even taking a step back, right? Like we were the ones who came out with this original paper in 2017 saying nature is a third of the climate solution. Now, I work with a lot of people at TNC who don't work on offsets and who are constantly saying, no, 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 we don't work on offsets. We're just working on natural climate solutions. And they always talk about, we, and we always talk about how offsets are one tool in the toolbox. But if you actually ask what the other tools are for nature, they don't really exist in many cases. I mean, there's some things around like subsidy and policy reform and things like that. But um, so, you know, the facts are we still need to address the huge biodiversity and nature crisis going on. The only finance really available right now is through carbon credits. Um, so we still need that to happen, right? Uh, obviously, there's technological improvements that can happen. You know, Vera just came out with their kind of improved uh, consolidated methodology for Red Plus. Um, but this needs to be financed regardless of if it's through carbon credits or something else. Um, and so I think carbon credits are kind of the easiest and best, most scalable option at the moment. So we're still very much pushing for that. Um, but, you know, if we're talking about removals versus reductions as well, I'm not going to go into technological removals because that's not my background. But, you know, if you're thinking about a forest and you're just trying to purchase reduction or removal credits from a forest, but then there's reductions happening on the other side of the forest, that makes zero sense. 
Um, so, you know, it, it has to be holistic, right? And that's more complicated, but nature is inherently more complicated. So I think that's just something we're going to have to keep grappling with. Um, but I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, and there's an element, um, people have talked about sort of flight to quality. So, and that's probably, there's some of that's a, a good thing. We obviously want quality credits, quality projects in, in that. Um, I think we will see more people looking into projects, and this, this, is a, this is a risk, I think, in this, the projects in the north, you know, because if you look at where things have gone wrong in projects or where some of the allegations, it's sort of governance and it's, it's about, you know, difficult projects in difficult parts of the world where it's, where it's hard to enforce stuff, which is sort of fairly fundamental long-term issues. So people will be, and those are really worthwhile from a sort of nature and social benefits point of view, but they are fundamentally riskier and harder. Um, I think we need to lean in to those collectively and still make sure we're doing difficult projects in difficult places. And that's part of the dialogue there. It's not, that's not about, oh, it, it's sort of cheap, get out of jail free credits. That's about doing things that are really worthwhile, which deliver these benefits there. Because the risk is otherwise, we do the easy projects in the easy places where it's easy to measure additionality, sort of permanence and these sort of issues. And that, those can be done as well, but we shouldn't do it at the, at the risk of the others. And I think that's probably the 2024 risk is we, there's the, the flight to quality is a flight to safety. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if, if we think about, in some ways, the current sort of dynamic, it, to, particularly if we look on the, on the nature side alone, it, it is a market failure that t today uh, there's more sort of incentive to, to replant a forest than to save one, you know, which just intuitively makes absolutely zero sense. And, 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 and we need to, to be doing all these things and sort of addressing that as well. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Steve Zwick. I do the Bionic Planet podcast, um, and I'm, I'm actually in the middle of a 10-part series on people in Kenya who are on the ground doing the, exactly these kind of activities, and I completely agree. I mean, it's really exciting to hear this consensus around the need to tell the, tell the full story of what happens on the ground, and especially in these areas where it's difficult. And I, I think there's, I've got a comment and a question. The, uh, one comment is uh, that I, I, I do feel like you know, what I've been telling is, you know, Kelly and I worked together about 10, 15 years ago, and I've been adamant about the need to tell accurate stories. And I find project proponents always want to tell positive stories. And my argument is that we need to tell the full story because they are positive and they involve challenges. They don't involve, we're not creating paradise in these things. We're making things less bad. And that's a difficult story to tell, but there needs to be an impetus for this because that's the real story. If we try to only tell fluffy story, and I'm looking at you because you said the same thing, but this is, we need to really uh, get, to tell the full story, what the challenges are, what they're up against, why it's never going to be perfect, and, and how these specific activities impact deforestation. Because when I came into this as a mainstream reporter, I started out at Time and Fortune, trying to understand this stuff. That link between these activities and deforestation, no one was, was really explaining that in a simple way because of the pyramid you talked about. They would, everything was either hyper-complicated or super simple, and nobody was in that middle zone. So I think that was my comment, is that we need to focus on these stories that really bring all these causal activities together. Another one is a question, which is, you know, this little, that, again, that Sam, what you opened up with, uh, this issue of the, the, the negative, you know, the, the, there's a small gaggle of outliers who are ideologically opposed, and they've got a little, little tiny bit of research. A lot of it's half-baked and cherry-picked and all this kind of stuff. They keep self-referencing it. I still think we, can, we should look at that as a target of opportunity because if we can blow that up, not just, a, you know, people tend to ignore that. They think it'll go away or we can only tell the positive stories. And I think we, sh we should be making an effort to isolate the really bad, illegitimate critiques, blow them up and say, however, these are real challenges. Doesn't mean it's perfect. There are serious issues that we're working with and, and kind of, you know, just sort of eliminate this whole, because we just saw it with the, the New Yorker story where, on, on Kariba, where she had a lot of legitimate, I mean, that was really, I was shocked when I saw what happened in Kariba, I have to admit. But then she wraps up with a summary of all this stuff that we know is, is junk. And I'm wondering if there's any appetite to just blow them up. When I mention this to people, you keep hearing, oh, don't give them air, or uh, don't, uh, don't get into fights with people who buy ink by the barrel. These are the, I mean, they're getting air, you know? 
and it's not like we're going to piss them off and suddenly they're going to hate us. I, I still think, I guess there's a comment, is, is there any appetite for just blowing that stuff up, getting it out of the way, uh, once and for all, pointing out who these people are and saying they're not legit, <laughs> you know, but these, but, these, uh, but these are legitimate issues. Did that, I hope I didn't ramble too much there. <laughs> no, 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 I, that was really helpful. I think my sense is yes, but it has to be part of a coordinated strategy because I think it's very difficult to drive change or a change in narrative through a purely negative strategy. So my sense is you want to plant a positive new narrative with your kind of uh, your, your bottom of the pyramid in terms of building blocks, in terms of supporting that, and then you need a counter uh, strategy that's also uh, highlighting the the kind of the ideological bent and the um, uh, the methodological weakness of the criticism that's gone on so far. But I, I completely also agree that we need to be careful that we're not. I think the issue with the critique that's gone so far is that we've actually ceded the ground that the market should be perfect as a as a as a kind of premise for the market's existence. And I think when I look at actually a lot of the criticism of the kind of corporate climate action so far. The problem is it's very difficult uh, as an external spectator to differentiate a corporate that is trying hard to decarbonize in a very difficult sector versus one that's just not trying. It's actually quite difficult to differentiate. And so the, both of those types of corporates get blasted with the same, with the same set, set of critiques. And then the carbon market has been pulled in with that. So I think what's needed, I, my sense, is some level of assurance uh, that there are c corporates that are trying hard to decarbonize and actually education around how difficult that is and then a, a another set of assurance that look they're using carbon markets as part of that but that's also very difficult to get right and so sort of buying permission for there to be mistakes made along the way and I think that's really important there hasn't been that conversation that look things aren't going to be perfect um, yeah I know we have two more questions that have been waiting uh, maybe if we can make Tell them quickly, we, we can squeeze them in still. Thank you very much. Um, Camilo Trujillo, Latin America and the Caribbean representative of AIDA. And I want to retake the Kelly's comment on changing the view uh, and the perspective of thinking uh, for the people who is on the ground. Uh, I mean, like local communities, indigenous people, Afro communities, etc. And I truly think, as a lack representative, that Global South needs from resources for nature-based solutions to preserve our ecosystems. So, well, you already some give a view about uh, carbon removal um, technology and also MBS and how it looks like. But uh, one of the points there that I was mm, trying to think is. You know very well technology. Uh, right now, only I guess it's like one percent of climate funds just go directly to indigenous communities, for example, just to say something. Um, so what I'm wondering is, in terms of technology, which is also which could help of help us to leverage like uh, all these MBS solutions to have integrity and all this. Technically, what should be done in the in the short term? What do you think with technology we can help to have integrity? Obviously, governance is other issue, but in terms of at least environmental integrity, what should be done? Oh, um, uh, do, do you want to take that as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, already these things are actually being done. So, that, uh, there's a huge proliferation of high quality satellite data. It's now readily available for free. There's now, again, an incredible leap forward in terms of what's possible with um, machine learning in terms of applying machine learning to that satellite data. So, we're able to now offer incredibly accurate models to actually put, mod model and, and track the performance of these projects. So, I think in you know, a lot, a lot of technology is already being deployed, and that's just going to work through the system now. I think a lot of the issues in the market are just actually a reflection of the fact that a lot of the projects in the market currently were generated over a decade ago when the, these tools weren't available. So what we're seeing flowing through the pipes now is a lot higher quality. And when I say quality, what I basically mean is there's just a lot more data certainty around the performance and the design of those projects. So, uh, you know, a lot of t technology is already being deployed. Something I'd like to see more of is y you mentioned... Um, community co-benefits and, and channeling finance to communities. I'd like to see more technology deployed in the design of projects to actually create transparency around how funds are being deployed. And I think that's a conversation the market needs to really have with itself, is around how we're going to drive more transparency at that level. Because I think a really important part of this new, new communication strategy needs to be em empowering communities to talk about 
why they want these funds, how they're using these funds, how these funds change their lives, how this is actually part of a just transition. But it's really hard to do that without data and without an ability to connect to those communities. So I'd love to see uh, technology deployed in that context as well. Yeah. Any, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, not, not so much a technology, but a bit on what Sam's point is. You know, right now, I think for TNC, one of our big focus areas is on benefit sharing and how to improve that. Um, and so thinking about, you know, ideally, how do we get IPLCs as actual partners in the project or leaders of the project? But if that's not the case because of, you know, a wide variety of extenuating circumstances, how do we make sure that they're getting kind of their fair share? And... A lot of that is getting into contracts, right? <laughs> Which is not necessarily technology, but it's thinking through how do we make those fairer? How do we make those maybe a little bit more responsive to market conditions if they're going really well? If they're not going really well. How do you kind of safeguard that they're still getting some of that, you know, funding? Um, and I think, you know, I think as Steve was saying with just IPLCs in general, it's it's also really critical to keep in mind that communities are not always going to agree. Right? If we were talking about a project in the U.S. and we said there was 100% agreement around my town of Longmont, Colorado, I think we're doctoring data, right? Like that, so I think it's fine that there's going to be disagreements. I think it's fine, you know, not everyone's going to be totally on board. And that's also part of that narrative of like the real complexities of trying to do this on the ground. So, so maybe that's a good place to end. I'm conscious we're, we're sort of at time. Uh, th thank you all for sort of coming. And maybe just a, a few thoughts to, to wrap up. I, th I guess a couple sort of key themes have come out of, you know, thinking about, you know, how do we sort of renew the story and sort of take, take back control uh, of, of the kind of future direction for, for the market as we look to 24. Uh, one, I think very clearly, and some good ideas around inspirational stories that we can, we can use to, to kind of kind of, you know, focus sort of other sort of perceptions and sort of begin to sort of move things in a different direction. Uh, the need to to sort of anchor those sort of more emotive stories and some strong facts around what is working and then the benefits, but also being very, you know, open and honest about maybe things where we need to continue to push the envelope to sort of improve uh, improve the science, improve the standards to be able to do that. Um, and I would sort of, you know, hope if we can collectively sort of, you know, push in that sort of direction, uh, we'll be in, in a very different place and... Uh, COP29, wherever that may be ne next year. Like, So a very warm thank you to our panel, to you know, Jonathan Kelly, you know, Sam and Steve. Really appreciate you sort of making the time to, early this morning uh, and, and look forward to talking with you further in the future. Thank you. Thank you.